Okay, guys, uh, we're going to talk about transformers now. And uh, I mean, yeah, well, keep in mind, we have been a bit loosey goosey with the science plus or minus for the inductance and mutual inductance. Sometimes we talk, sometimes we put it in, sometimes we don't. Uh, sometimes we use Faraday's law, I should say d5 by dt, and sometimes we put minus d5 by dt. You be guided, keep, you know, do, do the derivation, calculate the value, but if you want to find the direction in which something flows, the minus sign only tells you that the induced magnetic field acts in such a way so as to oppose the change in the flux. So if you have two solenoids like this, okay, uh, like I had earlier, okay, and you are calculating the value of the induced EMF in two from one, this is two, this is one, Okay, fine. You can do it with, you know, without worrying about the sign. You just calculate the value. Uh, but if you want to find the direction in which it flows, or the actual expression, if you you have to put the minus sign in. Right? Um, now, it's not as important as remembering that the direction in which the current will flow in the second one is so that it opposes the uh, change of flux. So if you have current I here, I1 equal to I0, sine of omega t. Interesting would be to see if this is the current in the one. Okay, this is one, and it looks like that. Okay, what kind of plot am I gonna get for the current in two, okay? And you have to think about, you know, um, uh, uh, if you define that as positive, okay, uh, what does the current look like in two? And that it's gonna oppose the change in the current. You have increasing and decreasing, okay? You can use this to plot the, predict and plot, calculate, find the, then you have to be careful about the signs. You get the value, that's fine, but you have to either um, uh, keep the sign in there or uh, use Lenz's law to predict in which direction the uh, current is gonna flow in the other, in the other device, okay? Uh, keep in mind that when it's gonna calculate the value, we want to find the direction as well, right? So sometimes it's put in, sometimes it's not. Keep Lenz's law in mind. Um, transformers. This could be a transformer, right? So what you have a you know signal coming in, okay, and you have a pickup coil here. Why do we not use this as a transformer? Because I mean, why you can use this as a transformer too, right? You have a coil here and a, and a coil there, okay? That can work as well. The problem with these is that you lose a lot of energy. A lot of the magnetic energy, we know that we have magnetic energy stored in space. The magnetic field goes like this. Some of the magnetic field lines go here, but the buckle them, so you end up with wasting the magnetic energy, wasting your energy, and the uh, transformer is not very effective. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. That could be okay. Uh, or two coils, one, one around the other. But historically speaking for, you know, convenience and whatnot, you end up winding stuff around uh, an iron core, okay? So you have a, a, a primary set, okay? Let's say you have a, you know, uh, and then you have a secondary set here, okay? And you're picking up signals here and there. Uh, why do we use an iron core? Because we said, remember, that the magnetic field inside, let's say you have a solenoid, and you put an iron core in there, okay? Uh, and then the magnetic field is no longer mu naught i, it is mu and i, okay? Uh, well, mu could be huge, or iron core is big, very big. And what happens now is the domains will line up, right? So you have a magnetic field going this way, and the domains will line up so that actually they trap, they keep the field inside, okay? There is no reason for the field to go outside, so you have your, the bulk of your energy goes from here to there. Minimal losses, and you haven't lost much. Uh, that's the advantage of the iron core. So you have this uh, primary winding, let's say, uh, and you have epsilon primary, and you have n secondary, and you have epsilon secondary. How do they relate to one another? Well, let's say that you are, the iron core has the same dimensions here and there, so the flux, the flux per turn is the same on either end. The magnetic field is the same, the flux per turn is the same. So uh, what you end up with is phi, you know, phi uh, uh, epsilon induced in one is equal to uh, N, uh, N1 or N primary, D phi primary by DT, okay? And epsilon secondary is N secondary, D phi secondary by DT, okay? So these guys are the same. Uh, this is per turn. This is this here per turn, okay? 
and same as this one here, this is per turn. If these are equal, then I can say that epsilon primary over n primary is equal to epsilon secondary over n secondary. Energy is conserved in that you don't lose anything here, uh, but you can, uh, you know, um, you can have a step down, step up transformer, or uh, whatever, whatever it is that you uh, need to get out of this. Okay, uh, so how do you get like 200 volts being transferred? Why do we transfer energy? I mean, think about it. Why do you, you have a power station, right? Why do you send stuff out at very high voltage, right? You think about that for a bit. Um, pause the video and think about this. Why do I use high voltage to send out, uh, um, you know, why don't I send stuff at like uh, 50 volts, right? Um, I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, let's let's uh, just think about that, guys. Right? Why do power stations transmit at very very high voltage? Right. So you have your power station here, okay? No, uh, oh, other chimney stacks, stuff like that, okay? And you have your city there, okay? and it goes in, it goes out, it goes back this way, and you have a long transmission line, right? and you're transmitting at very high voltage. And why, what's the reason? Uh, a lot of time people say that, well, the power from the station is I squared R. That's, you know, well, imagine if the resistance of the line is R, then we have a problem, right? We got a problem. And that, okay, if the power is I squared R, it's all going to R. What's going to light up all these houses? No, the power is not that. The power is equal to U times I. Okay? The power that the station puts out is U times, uh, sorry, V times I. U is V times I. Okay? So, yeah, the power lost in the lines, the power lost here is P is equal to I squared R. That is true. Okay? But that is not what the station puts out. Puts out I delta V or IV. Okay? And uh, some of that goes into I squared R. So you better make sure then, uh, what are you looking at now? You better make sure that I squared R is not a significant amount of IV. Now how do you do that? Well, if you, your losses are I squared R, right? So you want to minimize I, you do that by cranking up V, the same power is being put out, you crank up V, you bring down I, I see the huge, huge losses if you increase the current. If you decrease the voltage by which you transmit the line, the, the, the uh, the energy, you got serious issues in terms of losses, so that's why you transmit to like 200,000 volts or uh, whatever it might be, right? Um, all right, folks. Um, last bit I'll talk to you about is the following. Let's say you have a coax cable, right? A coax cable, and you want to um, calculate the conductance of the coax cable. So the, uh, the inductance of the coax cable, right? And this is really interesting discussion in that, you know, uh, you, okay, so you look at the cross section of this thing and you say that, let me draw a better diagram here, right? Let's say the coax cable looks like this, right? And it's long coax cable, so you're calculating the conductance per unit length. You can calculate the capacitance per unit length as well, right? And let's take like, a cross section of this, and I'd like to calculate the inductance of this area here, this part here. This has length L, okay? And this thing has current I running in it, okay? Uh, how do I calculate the inductance of this thing? So we say that current I will produce magnetic field B. We did this example not, not too long ago, okay? Magnetic field B here, and that magnetic field is gonna go down, okay? Uh, because, well, what? Okay, because you know, Ampere's law, okay? Says uh, B is equal to mu naught I over two pi R. And okay, so what is the flux going through an area like this? The flux, if this is dr here, okay? And then the flux is equal to d phi equal to mu naught I over two pi R times L dr. Okay, that's great, it's awesome. So now then the magnetic flux the flux is equal to uh, phi, is equal to the integral of d phi, integral of u naught i over two phi r times L dr, okay? As we go from, let's call this A to B, 
okay? And this is B, okay? And we're calculating the inductance of this part, right? Uh, so A to B, and that's gonna be something you've seen before, mu naught I over two pi times L multiplied by ln of B over C. So the inductance now, guys, inductance L is equal to phi over I. But we really calculate the inductance per unit length because it becomes messy, otherwise it blows up on you, and that becomes equal to mu uh, naught uh, over two pi ln of B over A. Okay, that's cool. Now, that's straightforward. No problem there. Uh, I have a post-it for you. I'll post for you soon, if I haven't posted yet, um, uh, a discussion on how to calculate the inductance of this part, okay? And that's a really interesting discussion. It connects to flux linkage and the fact that, you know, it, it becomes really interesting, okay? I won't be doing it here, uh, but keep an eye out for that to, to see how it's done. And one thing I will leave you with now is can you calculate the inductance of a toroid, okay? So, you know, um, you have a toroid, this is wound like, you know, try to do a good job with this, okay? okay. Uh, so you have a toroid, okay? And uh, first, we'd like to see, uh, we'd like to see, uh, are we able to use Amper's law to calculate the field inside a toroid? So what do you do in this case? You have a number of turns, n, and you construct your Empyrean loop here, and you say, well, the integral of b dot dl on the loop is b times, 2 pi r is equal to mu naught, i enclosed is n times i, right? So, yeah, so, so it is the total number of turns in that. So you can get the field from there, right? So you have the field, and it depends on r, as you know, goes as 1 over r, and how do you calculate the inductance of this thing? Or how do you calculate the total magnetic energy stored in this, right? Um, the inductance is, you got to calculate the flux here. And, you know, you have, you know, a, a, a donut that is, you can have a donut that is circular, like that, which becomes a, an interesting, interesting calculation. Or you can have a donut, right? And there are some problems of previous final exams that show you that, you know, it's a rectangular. So the, the, the wire is wound around the rectangular. Uh, you see you have a rectangular cross section like that. And that is more doable than the annulus kind of. Uh, discussion, right? So, uh, what do you have to do to calculate the phi? So, what is phi equal to? Okay, integral of b dot d a. Okay, going here, uh, and, uh, and there is a number of turns too. So, you have to multiply by n as well. Okay, so you calculate the flux divided by i. You get the inductance of this thing. Okay, and how do you calculate the energy inside? Easier you do the integral of uh, you know. Uh, so, the energy inside can be either given by one half L I squared, that's the total energy inside the, uh, the toroid, you calculate I, you calculate, or you could do the integral of what, remember, the energy density, uh, B squared over two mu naught dot dV, okay? Triple integral over the volume of the toroid, okay? I'll leave you with that. Uh, folks, I think this covers everything that I wanted to cover with you. Uh, in the course, um, we have uh, zipped through some things because um, we were uh, a short week, short a week. Uh, however, I uh, want to say again that you've been a wonderful class, uh, the most engaged software class I've ever had. Um, I understand that the, you know uh, some of you uh, might have had some some uh, some difficulties with uh, the material. Um, I wish we had more office hours to, to talk. I'll try to set up some office hours for you and see how Zoom works or whatever. Uh, but for now, I'm very grateful to having had you. The engagement in the class was very high. You guys were an awesome class to teach. I wish you all the best. Um, stay in good spirits and spread good spirits around. And um, uh, please, when you come back, uh, let's get together for, uh, you know, stop by and have a coffee or, uh, you know, stay in touch. Let me know how you're doing. Um, uh, I wish you all the best. Bye-bye. Okay,